Matters of Concern William Terrell, missing since the 12th of September 2014. As we all know, nothing has revealed William's fate and no one has been charged over his disappearance. We have been told many stories over the years about what may have happened to William, the moments preceding and what was supposed to have occurred immediately after he went missing. We have been given the impression that no one knew that the family were going for a visit to the grandmother's house as it was a surprise visit. And yet if they had followed the normal code of behaviour for a foster child, they would have had to inform and receive the approval of child protection services before making such a move. Most of the stories are riddled in doubt because there has been no continuity in the telling of them. When the event does not fit in with the time frame, then the time frame gets changed. Statements from the foster parents that should have been taken down within a day or two of William's disappearance were not carried out until weeks later, whereas with the biological parents, they were taken to a police station in Sydney within a couple of days for a formal statement to be taken. What plausible explanation could be given as to why such an action was taken with one family but not the other? The same question would be asked of the biological parents if the reverse had occurred. Does this demonstrate a fair and equal approach or does it demonstrate that from the very beginning of the case that the foster parents were assumed to be guiltless and therefore not put under the same scrutiny as the biological parents? Or could it have played out in this way because the police were not simply dealing with the foster parents as individuals, as in the case of the biological parents, but that they were answerable to child protection services for every move they made? Being blindsided in this way would only hinder the investigation as without being objective, a lot of the critical information would get filtered out and in turn would make, make it extremely difficult for anyone to make an informed, open-minded decision. Mr Craddock, the senior counsellor, assisting the coroner at Williams' inquest, told us that every aspect of the investigation would be reviewed again and again until the case is solved and that there are no fixed conclusions. This statement of there being no fixed conclusions is contrary to what is being demonstrated. From the onset and without evidence, certain testimonies have been accepted and echoed back out to the public as if proven to be true without any proof at all. Detectives have claimed to know what they could not possibly know and have continually repeated the foster carer story as if it is a fact, a fixed conclusion. Unfortunately, when something settles in as a fixed conclusion, it is difficult to shift. It is no secret that there was a failing on behalf of the biological parents, which they themselves have been open and honest about from the beginning. This, however, has not stopped some of the journalists from continually giving out confidential information about the biological parents to the public, while telling us that there is a gag order in place and that they are not permitted to give out any personal information about the foster carers. Is this fair? Does this dividing and separating foster carers from biological parents do anything other than to create the stigma itself? How can it honestly be put forth and believed in by the Australian public that such a law would in any way be of benefit to William or the carers? Unless, of course, like a blanket of invisibility, it was being used to render the wearers invisible. Let's face it, such laws are antiquated and are kept in place not to protect the foster carers or the children in their care, but to protect the organisations from being held accountable for their decisions. Who are these foster parents? Do they have any past records? Have they ever had any prior issues with the police or taken recreational drugs? Has there ever been any mental issues or concerns? I ask these questions because the answers to these confidential questions are continually being put forth about the biological parents because there is no suppression order in place to protect them. On almost every podcast, these so-called journalists continue to repeat the failings of the biological parents over and over again. You know it's coming when they say, oh, let's go back to before William was put into the care of the foster parents. That way, they create a protective boundary around themselves 
to not upset the powers that control the way the case is run as they dance timidly around the real issues in question. This is misleading and reeks of deception. There is no gag order in place when they are delivering a glowing reference about the foster parents, but where it does come into play is when doubt meets honesty, and honesty is not the preferred position to take. The point is, why continually go back to when William wasn't missing and repeat the failings of the biological parents? Does this do anything to further the case? Who is supplying all this confidential information to the journalists for publication? And why would the journalists be gagged when it comes to the foster parents, although give out the most personal and confidential information about the biological parents without a second thought? Where are the laws to protect the biological parents from continually being subjected to this type of rant? What makes this situation even more insane is that you have some of these journalists actually claiming that the unfortunate ones are the foster carers, while they themselves are rubbing salt into the wounds of the biological parents. Oh my, what a crazy world we live in. Let's not lose sight that William did not go missing while in the biological parents' care, so why not set the focus on finding out what may have happened to him, even if it means that we have to also scrutinise the foster carers to do so? What do we have when the given result or outcome is without any evidence to support the fixed conclusion? All we have is a set of beliefs that are not supported in any, any way, shape or form by anything but a controlled opposition. When there is no fixed conclusion, then statements such as William went missing from his foster grandmother's house in Kendall would read as it is alleged or it is claimed that William went missing from his foster grandmother's house in Kendall. Why then is it put to the public as if it's a fact, a set conclusion, rather than a possibility that may or may not have happened and therefore needs further investigation? Where is the proof that William ever made it to Kendall? Up until now, it has been hearsay and a photo of William in a Spider-Man outfit, a photo that has obviously been tampered with. The timestamp discrepancy is just one point of contention when it comes to the photograph. Many others have been pointed out and an important factor to remember is that even though the Spider-Man photo was said to have been taken only moments before William went missing, this was not the photo or image on the camera's FD card that was initially handed over to identify William by. A lingering question remains. If the electronic gadgets were all handed over to the police for investigation purposes, as we were told, then wouldn't the police already have been in possession of the camera that contained the photo of William in his Spider-Man's outfit? And yet we are told that the foster mother had forgotten, having taken the photo of William and handed it over two or three days later. Many questions have been asked by many people about the photo of William in his Spider-Man's outfit, and I would like to share some with you in the hope that these may be addressed when the inquest resumes in March 2020. Number one. Has William been superimposed onto another photograph, making him look like he is on the deck that day? Number two, why is William in a flimsy Spider-Man outfit and without shoes on, while the foster grandmother and William's sister appear all rugged up in warm clothing? Number three, why do reports put forward that William looks happy in the photo where he is dressed in the Spider-Man's costume when it is blatantly obvious that he does not? These questions and many more keep surfacing as the public begins to look more deeply into the case. We are told that William and his sister were picked up early from daycare on the 11th of September 2014. Where is the evidence to support this statement? Were the children signed out by one or both foster carers? And what was the exact time that this took place? Were statements ever taken from the daycare workers? These and many other questions have yet to be examined at the inquest. According to reports, there was footage of William and his sister with the foster carers caught on camera at McDonald's in Raymond Terrace, New South Wales, which could hardly be denied if it showed up on the McDonald's camera footage.
But how can this be verified if the footage isn't shown? This important footage was not shown at the inquest. Such important evidence would be a perfect way to be able to identify William by if such footage was shared with the public. Why not pixelate the foster carers and William's sister's face out and show us the last known live sighting of William? We have viewed a pixelated video of the foster father speaking with a detective while doing a round of the foster grandmother's yard. We have viewed a pixelated video of the foster mother speaking to the detective in the front of the foster grandmother's yard. We have seen and heard both foster parents share their story on numerous occasions, although it does get a little confusing while being told by the journalists that the foster carers are not permitted to speak out. We have all, we have been shown videos of the biological parents and William's grandmother, videos of the mistreatment of Mr Spedding and his wife, videos of Paul Savage and many of the other people of interest, videos of Mr Chapman, the search and the detectives, and yet the most relevant, the most important video of all, the last known live footage of William, is not only kept from the public, but not even shown at the inquest. And apparently not even the biological parents or their barrister has had the opportunity of viewing the footage. Surely this can't be true. It is alleged that the CCTV camera footage from McDonald's shows the whole family alive and well, but without it being viewed, such information is meaningless. A snapshot or a still is not proof, as we have found out with the Spider-Man photo of William, neither is hearsay. Someone supposedly has the evidence in the form of an action video which places William at McDonald's, then why not show it? Was he happy? How was William's demeanour? How does the image compare with the Spider-Man photo that we were shown? This case has become so lost in deception, false claims and innuendos that no amount of claiming it has been verified can be taken seriously without the actual evidence to prove it. While the doubt remains, William cannot even be accounted for up to this point. Then we are told that the next stop by the foster parents was on the Pacific Highway heading towards Kendall. According to the foster parents, they stopped again after leaving McDonald's about five to seven minutes down the road to put pull-ups on the children. It was a dark area, no one else was about. They stopped for only five minutes and then continued. What proof do we have that this happened? Was the area ever searched? Has this story ever been confirmed? At about 9pm, it is alleged that they arrived at the grandmother's house, but is there any evidence that proves that this was the actual time of arrival? Evidence is the key here. What supports the assertion? Has direct proof been provided? And if so, does it reveal whether the proposed suggestion is true or valid? When you draw a conclusion from what you heard without any evidence to support the claims and then allege such claims to be facts, it's not very convincing. Take, for example, some of the well-known instances that have helped shape the way in which this case has been viewed. The most obvious being how the foster carers of William are treated in comparison to the biological parents and all the other people of interest in the case. A noticeable contrast begins to build between dark and light, good and bad, right and wrong. This contrast is built from opinion, not fact, and seems to take such a hold that only the opinions get highlighted and the obvious gets completely overlooked. A perfect example is how Bill Spedding and his family have been treated throughout this whole ideal. Portrayed as the dark side, the wrongdoer, the bad guy. It didn't matter that the opinions were totally lacking in evidence. He became the bullseye, the target, and whether he was innocent or not just didn't figure into the equation. We are told that there are suppression orders in place for foster parents to remain anonymous. We are told by the journalists that they are under a gag order and cannot share any personal information about William's foster carers because they are foster parents and to do so could land them in jail. The obvious that has been totally overlooked is that Bill Spedding and his wife are also foster parents. Both families are bringing up children that are not their own. 
Do we see the Department of Child Protection jumping up and down, protect, protesting on the spending family's behalf? No. We see them removing the children from the family's care without any evidence of mistreatment. Do we see the same happening with the foster carers of William? No. William's sister still remains in their care, even though they were the prime suspects as William went missing under their watch. Do we see the journalists being put under a gag order when it comes to the spedding family? Have they had the same opportunity of remaining anonymous? It is not difficult to see how these two fa foster families have been treated so totally differently. The police, the journalists and the public were not put on a leash when it came to the spedding, fa to the spedding family. It was like a frenzy free-for-all. Shouldn't all foster parents be subject to the same rules? Or is there a selected category of foster parents? Criteria being, you can't be in any way related to the child or children in your care. It is all just too ridiculous to even contemplate, as according to the Department of Child Protection and their policies, every rule in the book has been broken when it comes down to Bill Spedding and his family. So when are we going to start seeing some arrests? Hands up all the policy enforcers, the detectives and journalists that have broken the foster parents' laws when it comes to Bill Spedding's family. We know who you are and you all have a lot of explaining to do. Never underestimate the public's ability to see through such a charade. Take a clown. The disguise may hide what the individual looks like, but the contradictions that come from the clown's mouth are not hidden. Where is the evidence to support what the foster carers have claimed? This question would be asked of every suspect, so why not ask it of William's foster carers? Show us the evidence of the CCTV footage of McDonald's. Show us the evidence that William made it to Kendall. Show us the evidence that he arrived at about 9pm on the evening of the 11th of September 2014. Show us the evidence of the two cars that were supposedly parked in Benaroon Drive the following morning for at least two to two and a half hours. Show us the evidence that a third car pulled into the neighbour's driveway and drove back past the foster grandmother's house where in the initial telling of the story the occupant was not seen and then in the next telling of the story he was described as driving with intention, exchanging suspicious, suspicious glances. Show us the evidence you have of the semi-trailer on Batar Creek Road. Show us the evidence of the search into the bush where the foster mother thought she may have heard a child scream. Show us how the foster mother could have made three trips to Batar Creek Road within an impossible time frame. First trip apparently to the bushy area of Batar Creek Road where she thought she heard a child scream. Second trip to the driving school where she came across a semi-trailer and driver. And third trip with the neighbour. Show us anything that amounts to evidence to prove all three of these trips actually happened. And if they did, then the time of William's disappearance and the foster father's arrival home from Lakewood would have to change again. All we have are claims that don't fit into any time frames given, and yet they have been repeated so often that they begin appearing to be fixed conclusions. So Mr Craddock, in line with your own statement of there being no fixed conclusions, all these stories can be eliminated as yet not proven, which takes us back even prior to McDonald's. Let's look again. The foster carers, William and his sister, were seen leaving McDonald's. Obviously, the time would be logged as part of the evidence. They travelled along the Pacific Highway and not too far down the road, it is alleged that they stopped to put pull-ups on the children. Was this information given freely by the foster carers or was it prompted? By prompted, I mean, was there some evidence that placed them in that spot and an explanation was needed to coincide with that evidence? Explanation being, we stopped to put pull-ups on the children. Or was this information given without any prompting at all? Is there any camera footage along the way of William that placed his arrival in Kendall at the time that was given? If not, it cannot be claimed with any certainty and therefore is inconclusive. Let's assume for a moment that we have made it to Kendall and we begin to look for the evidence that can place him there. What do we have? Firstly, a sniffer dog that picked up no scent of William. 
The foster mother tells us there were at least three suspicious cars. All three were suspected according to her. They left her feeling uncomfortable and she questioned why the initial two were loitering about because never in the whole time her parents had lived in Kendall had cars parked on that road. If I was reading a novel at this point, I would have figured out that the occupants of these cars were obviously up to no good and would be waiting in an anticipation of what's to follow. Then a third car appears on the scene where we are told the occupant is not visible and then we get given a lavish description of what the driver looked like. Hmm. My suspicion begins to rise. I sit scratching my head trying to figure out what is going on here. This case is beginning to read like a novel, but unfortunately it's not. Unlike fiction that is made up in storytelling, the truth doesn't change. It is there for everyone to see, just out of sight until the veil of deception gets lifted. My apologies to the coroner for adding to your already heavy workload. You may need to expand on the time you have set aside for the in upcoming inquest in March, as getting to the bottom of this case is not going to be an easy one. Kind regards, Jan.